first part of chapter eight of the first volume of the life of reason this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by fredrik karlsson the life of reason by george santayana chapter eight on the relative value of things and ideas side note moral tone of opinions derived from their logical principle those who look back upon the history of opinion for many centuries commonly feel by a vague but profound instinct that certain consecrated doctrines have an inherent dignity and spirituality while other speculative tendencies and other vocabularies seem wedded to all that is ignoble and shallow so fundamental is this moral tone in philosophy that people are usually more firmly convinced that their opinions are precious than that they are true they may avow in reflective moments that they may be in error seeing that thinkers of no less repute have maintained opposite opinions but they are commonly absolutely sure that if their own views would be generally accepted it would be a boon to mankind that in fact the moral interests of the race are bound up not with discovering what may chance to be true but with discovering the truth to have a particular complexion this predominant trust in moral judgment is in some cases conscious and avowed so that philosophers invite the world to embrace tenets for which no evidence is offered but that they chime in with current aspirations or traditional bias thus the substance of things hoped for becomes even in philosophy the evidence of things not seen such faith is indeed profoundly human and has accompanied the mind in all its gropings and discoveries preference being the primary principle of discrimination and attention reason in her earliest manifestations already discovered her affinities and incapacities and lauded the ideas she framed with friendliness or hostility it is not strange that her latest constructions should inherit this relation to the will and we shall see that the moral tone and affinity of metaphysical systems correspond exactly with the primary function belonging to that type of idea on which they are based idealistic systems still cultivating concretions in discourse study the first conditions of knowledge and the last interests of life materialistic systems still emphasizing concretions in existence describe causal relations and the habits of nature thus the spiritual value of various philosophies rests in the last instance on the kind of good which originally attached the mind to that habit and plane of ideation side note concretions in discourse express instinctive reactions we have said that perceptions must be recognized before they can be associated by contiguity and that consequently the fusion of temporarily diffused experiences must precede their local fusion into material objects it might be urged in opposition to this statement that concrete objects can be recognized in practice before their general qualities have been distinguished in discourse recognition may be instinctive that is based on the repetition of a felt reaction or emotion rather than on any memory of a former occasion on which the same perception occurred such an objection seems to be well grounded for it is instinctive adjustments and suggested action that give cognitive value to sensation and endow it with that transitive force which makes it consciously representative of what is past future or absent if practical instinct did not stretch what is given into what is meant reason could never recognize the datum for a copy of an ideal object sidenote idealism rudimentary this description of the case involves an application or extension of our theory rather than an argument against it 
for where recognition is instinctive and a familiar action is performed with absent-minded confidence and without attending to the indications that justify that action there is an eminent degree of qualitative concretion in experience present impressions are merged so completely in structural survivals of the past that instead of arousing any ideas distinct enough to be objectified they merely stimulate the inner sense remained embedded in the general feeling of motion or life and constitute in fact a heightened sentiment of pure vitality and freedom for the lowest and vaguest of concretions in discourse are the ideas of self and of an embosoming external being with the felt continuity of both what fichte would call the ego the non-ego and life where no particular events are recognized there is still a feeling of continuous existence we trail after us from our whole past some sense of the continuous energy and movement both of our passionate fancies and of the phantasmagoria capriciously at work beyond an ignorant mind believes itself omniscient and omnipotent those impulses in itself which really represent the inertia and unspent momentum of its last dream it regards as the creative forces of nature the first lines of cleavage and the first recognizable bulks at which attention is arrested are in truth those shadowy fichtean divisions such are the rude beginnings of logical architecture in its ability to descry anything definite and fixed for want of an acquired empirical background and a distinct memory the mind flounders forward in a dream full of prophecies and wayward identifications the world possesses as yet in its regard only the superficial forms that appear in reverie it has no hidden machinery no third dimension in which unobserved and perpetual operations are going on its only terms in a word are concretions in discourse ideas combined in their aesthetic and logical harmonies not in their habitual and efficacious conjunctions the disorder of such experience is still a spontaneous disorder it has not discovered how calculable are its unpremeditated shocks the cataclysms that occur seem to have only ideal grounds and only dramatic meaning though the dream may have its terrors and degenerate at moments into a nightmare it has still infinite plasticity and buoyancy what perceptions are retained merge in those haunting and friendly presences they have an intelligible and congenial character because they appear as parts and effluences of an inner fiction evolving according to the barbaric prosody of an almost infant mind this is the fairyland of idealism where only the miraculous seems a matter of course and every hint of what is purely natural is disregarded for the truly natural still seems artificial dead and remote new and disconcerting facts which intrude themselves inopportunely into the story chill the currents of spontaneous imagination and are rejected as long as possible for being alien and perverse perceptions on the contrary which can be attached to the old presences as confirmations or corollaries become at once parts of the warp and woof of what we call ourselves they seem of the very substance of spirit obeying a vital momentum and flowing from the inmost principle of being and they are so much akin to human presumptions that they pass for manifestations of necessary truth thus the demonstrations of geometry being but the intent explication of a long consolidated ideal concretion which we call space 
are welcomed by the mind as in a sense familiar and as revelations of a truth implicit in the soul so that plato could plausibly take them for recollections of prenatal wisdom but a rocket that bursts into sparks of a dozen colours even if expected is expected with anxiety and observed with surprise it assaults the senses at an incalculable moment with a sensation individual and new the exciting tension and lively stimulus may please in their way yet the badge of the accidental and unmeaning adheres to the thing it is a trivial experience and one quickly forgotten the shock is superficial and were it repeated would soon fatigue we should retire with relief into darkness and silence to our permanent and rational thoughts side note naturalism sad it is a remarkable fact which may easily be misinterpreted that while all the benefits and pleasures of life seem to be associated with external things and all certain knowledge seems to describe material laws yet a deified nature has generally inspired a religion of melancholy why should the only intelligible philosophy seem to defeat reason and the chief means of benefiting mankind seem to blast our best hopes whence this profound aversion to so beautiful and fruitful a universe whence this persistent search for invisible regions and powers and for metaphysical explanations that can explain nothing while nature's voice without and within man cries aloud to him to look act and enjoy and when some one in protest against such senseless oracular prejudices has actually embraced the life and faith of nature and taught others to look to the natural world for all motives and sanctions expecting thus to refresh and marvellously to invigorate human life why have those innocent hopes failed so miserably why is that sensuous optimism we may call greek or that industrial optimism we may call american such a thin disguise for despair why does each melt away and become a mockery at the first approach of reflection why has man's conscience in the end invariably rebelled against naturalism and reverted in some form or other to a cultus of the unseen side note the soul akin to the eternal and ideal we may answer in the words of saint paul because things seen are temporal and things not seen are eternal and we may add remembering our analysis of the objects inhabiting the mind that the eternal is the truly human that which is akin to the first indispensable products of intelligence which arise by the fusion of successive images in discourse and transcend the particular in time peopling the mind with permanent and recognizable objects and strengthening it with a synthetic dramatic apprehension of itself and its own experience concretion in existence on the contrary yields essentially detached and empirical unities foreign to mind in spite of their order and unintelligible in spite of their clearness reason fails to assimilate in them precisely that which makes them real namely their presence here and now in this order and number the form and quality of them we can retain domesticate and weave into the texture of reflection but their existence and individuality remain a datum of sense needing to be verified anew at every moment and actually receiving continual verification or disproof why we live in this world this world we call it not without the justifiable pathos 
for many other worlds are conceivable and if discovered might prove more rational and intelligible and more akin to the soul than this strange universe which man has hitherto always looked upon with increasing astonishment the materials of experience are no sooner in hand than they are transformed by intelligence reduced to those permanent presences those natures and relations which alone can live in discourse those materials rearranged into the abstract summaries we call history or science or pieced out into the reconstructions and extensions we call poetry religion furnish us with ideas of as many dream worlds as we please all nearer to reason's ideal than is the actual chaos of perceptual experience and some nearer to the heart's desire when an empirical philosophy therefore calls us back from the irresponsible flights of imagination to the shock of sense and tries to remind us that in this alone we touch existence and come upon fact we feel dispossessed of our nature and cramped in our life the actuality possessed by external experience cannot make up for its instability nor the applicability of scientific principles for their hypothetical character the dependence upon sense which we are reduced to when we consider the world of existences becomes a too plain hint of our essential impotence and mortality while the play of logical fancy though it remain inevitable is saddened by a consciousness of its own insignificance side note her inexperience that dignity then which inheres in logical ideas and their affinity to moral enthusiasm springs from their congruity with the primary habits of intelligence and idealization the soul or self or personality which in sophisticated social life is so much the centre of passion and concern is itself an idea a concretion in discourse and the level on which it swims comes to be by association and affinity the region of all the more vivid and massive human interests the pleasures which lie beneath it are ignored and the ideals which lie above it are not perceived aversion to an empirical or naturalistic philosophy accordingly expresses a sort of logical patriotism and attachment to homespun ideas the actual is too remote and unfriendly to the dreamer to understand it he has to learn a foreign tongue which his native prejudice imagines to be unmeaning and unpoetical the truth is however that nature's language is too rich for man and the discomfort he feels when he is compelled to use it merely marks his lack of education there is nothing cheaper than idealism it can be had by merely not observing the inaptitude of our chance prejudices and by declaring that the first rhymes that have struck our ear are the eternal and necessary harmonies of the world side note platonism spontaneous the thinker's bias is naturally favourable to logical ideas the man of reflection will attribute as far as possible validity and reality to these alone platonism remains the classic instance of this way of thinking living in an age of rhetoric with an education that dealt with nothing but ideal entities verbal moral or mathematical plato saw in concretions in discourse the true elements of being definable meanings being the terms of thought must also he fancied be the constituents of reality and with that directness and audacity which was possible to the ancients and of which pythagoreans and eleatics had already given brilliant examples 
he set up these terms of discourse like the pythagorean numbers for absolute and eternal entities existing before all things revealed in all things giving the cosmic artificer his models and the creature his goal by some inexplicable necessity the creation had taken place the ideas had multiplied themselves in a flux of innumerable images which could be recognized by their resemblance to their originals but were at once cancelled and expunged by virtue of their essential inadequacy what sounds are to words and words to thoughts that was a thing to its idea end of chapter eight part one